I'm Max Seeley. I am the lead en electrical engineer for uh, the digital solutions group within 3M. And uh, you know what my group does is is essentially we design small form factor, high performance electronics uh, that find application in one of our 24 divisions within 3M. In particular, my focus at 3M is kind of bringing a holistic approach to the design process. I mean, just like you heard Jeremy talking about in there. Uh, I do focus on board design, uh, but you know, I also am an electrical engineer and my role at 3M right now is, is really guiding the entire process from start to finish. Um, I'm Carl Schatke. I've been designing printed circuit boards for 46 years. I uh, currently work at a leading EV company in Silicon Valley and uh, design a wide variety of printed circuit boards. Mostly I'm supporting electrical engineers in the design of their products um, and very experienced with uh, different processes and development of processes for you know this uh, schematic to PCB process is what we're going to be focusing on. Um, hope to use my experience to help you have a better experience in your design flow and process. Sure. So Carl and I, um, I mean we, we really got to know each other through uh, the LTM live conferences but we thought it would be interesting to do a presentation where we talk about that, that step in between when design capture is completed and when we've laid the first trace on a PCB. And my tendency at that point is I'm seeing light at the end of the tunnel. You know, I'm, I'm coming up on the part of the design process that I enjoy the most, that I find the most tangible and rewarding. And, you know, what I've seen is this is a phase of the, the design process where, where people really like to rush. I mean, they really want to get that first trace laid down. And I, I think more often than not, uh, you know, if you don't do some methodical steps at this point, you will find yourself backed into a corner or undoing the work that you've already started to do, or worse, you know, putting a board out to spin that needs uh, significant changes in it to meet the needs of the product. So, so one of the things that I'm thinking about as a PCB designer, when a design is handed off to me, is what's going to create that optimal design for that electrical engineer? You know, what's 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 the work environment? What's the environment that it's going to go into? What are the performance requirements that are going to be needed? And as a designer, it's my job to elicit all that information from. The engineer that I'm working with, like in this case it's going to be Max, how do I gather all that information? I'm looking for any gaps in what he's giving me so I can ask about it. I'm also looking to clarify any information that's uh, ambiguous to me and I want to ferret out as much information as I can about his thought in the design process because I may have uh, an idea of how to help him do his job better. He may not have thought of something and I want to add uh, that question to my list to him as he goes through his product and he's explained to me what he wants. My job is to elicit as much information as possible during this initial PCB to, you know, the schematic to PCB handoff. I want to know what he's designing and, and gather as much as possible from him in, in that process. And I think one of the things that was really interesting for me in this process was you know, I really wanted to pick Carl's brain because he's got an incredible amount of experience, you know, designing a, a significant number of PCBs. And I was coming, you know, kind of coming into this with the expectation that we were going to have very different approaches to our methodology. And what was, I think, really refreshing is, is what we discovered in putting together this, this presentation is there was generally... Way more similarities and differences. Yes, and, yeah. and I, I'm hard-pressed to think of a difference. And uh, you don't need to rack your brain. <laughs> um, the, the other thing I would say is, you know, and, and I think this is true for any step in the design process, I see people make decisions 
to expedite the process, to cut corners. And invariably, you know, that ends up coming back to haunt them. And I, I think if you take some time and take an extra week, uh, you know, on this phase of the, the process, you know, depending on the complexity of the board, of course, uh, it's going to pay out rewards in terms of, you know, reduced design cycles and really wasted time down the road. But the work is the work, and it's very important to frame, you know, like your work as far as like a process flow. A lot of times project engineers are, I need it yesterday, and, you know, we need to bring the project um, management team to reality sometimes, and we just have to explain the process to them in a way they understand. If we feel we need a little bit more time, we really have to bargain for that rather than shortcut the process and not come up with the optimal, you know, solution. Sometimes it is, you know, speed. We're going to talk about these different uh, aspects of the project. So each project that you start in has a particular scope, uh, and then it has a schedule need, and it has the cost of that project, and then, you know, a certain level of of expectation for the quality. And this is gonna vary widely based on what you're designing. Everybody in this room has different kind of projects that they do, and they would put different scores on each of these as far as what would be the most important. So as a designer, I'm trying to find out from Max, you know, what's most important to you? Is it the quality, is it the cost, is it the schedule? You know, what's the scope of this project? Where? How does this all play together? And it's very important to initially understand this information so that um, you work on the right things at the right time in the right way. Um, yeah. Let's... And and for this this presentation, and you know, I and we're making an assumption. Yeah. Right? Well, the the assumption is that we're going to deal with a, a high quality, high volume project, and. You know, I, I even when you're looking at a a lower quantity, uh, you know, project that doesn't need to be as rigorous, I still think you need to be very careful about you know where you trim off stuff in your your process. So we're going to talk about in the presentation. We're going to talk about schematics and the best practices with schematics and how that can really lay the foundation for a, a sound uh, PCB layout. We're going to talk about some of the pre-layout simulation you can do and the results of that simulation, how you'll use that simulation in your printed circuit board layout. Uh, the important decisions and discussions that you need to have at this point. Uh, and, you know, we'll, we'll go into that and setting up the, the PCB for layout and the steps that you need to complete, complete prior to putting a, a trace on the board. And then uh, we'll take some time for a question and discussion, hopefully if we have some time at the end. So schematics. Uh, you know, I gave a keynote here, well, in Munich on, on schematics last year. And I actually, you know, think that this is one of the most important schematics that you can have uh, in your schematics. And this is one of my top level schematics. I, I am a firm believer in hierarchical design. And furthermore, what I've done in this, this top level schematic uh, is, is made use of color coding. And you'll see the, the color coding that I made use of is my power delivery elements are yellow, my connectors are pink, my memory elements are blue, uh, my primary circuits are green, and my antenna elements are purple. And what this top-level schematic allows is for us to see how the project is organized structurally. And this is really going to contribute to printed circuit board <coughs> layout because it's really going to enable me to have an a intelligent conversation uh, with my, my layout person or myself if I'm doing the layout myself on how I'm going to structure that, that, that design and how I'm going to partition the different elements of that design. In addition, it allows me to clearly identify what are my critical signals, what are my high-speed signals, what are my RF signals, what's, what are my sensitive analog signals. I can also clearly see 
where my connector points are, where my connectors are into the design because that's an integral part of your design and some place that you really need to pay close attention to. Right. Yeah, so as a designer, I'm going to look at this. I mean, okay, so the connectors are super important. Those are going to usually be in a pre-placed configuration, and I'm going to be very uh, cognizant of where those are because, you know, when we place a board, the very first thing we do is we put, in, put on all the components that are locked in position uh, because a lot of other things are going to flow from that. So I, I'm going to be very interested in where these connectors are placed and how they're placed and then, um, you know, are they on the same edge of the board or are they on opposite edges? If he's done that, I want to ask him why. Um, we try to minimize, you know, inductive loops on our connectors for EMI reasons. Um, that may or may not be possible based on what this product's trying to do, but I'm going to ask those kind of questions. So one of the things you'll see in the top level schematic here is I make use of, of harnesses. And one of the motivations for harnesses in the top level schematic as opposed to individual wires for my nets is I can keep things a lot cleaner. And so I can group signals together and this isn't a spaghetti mess of, of wires going all over in between these sheet symbols. The other reason that I love to use harnesses in my design is because it also allows me to see the organization of my signals. So it clearly identifies how my signals are organized and how they're grouped because I, I construct my harnesses based on the functional grouping of my signals. Um, what we're also going to show, I think, when, when Vince gets up is he's going to show some of the, the tips and tricks with harnesses and some of the other uh, shortcuts that, that are enabled by using a harness. Uh, one thing that, uh, you know, when we were putting together this design, or sorry, this, this presentation, uh, one of the things I really enjoy about, you know, presenting at, at conferences like this is I always learn something or I relearn something that I had forgotten. So I was going through an old Altium reference design to pull out uh, some of the content for this, and I had forgot that you can use buses uh, in your harnesses. And so what that means is I can significantly cut down. You'll see what I did here is instead of having all these individual signals here, uh, I could have used the bus instead. And so that would greatly reduce the size of my harness, which really comes into play uh, when you're establishing connectivity on, on like an application processor uh, schematic, then I can bring in all my harnesses and fit them. So kind of building on that, that hierarchical uh, design. So one of the things that I am a firm believer in and we'll show it later on, but I'm a firm believer that, that every schematic page is a functional block. And one of the pieces of, of one of the tests you can do to see if you have a functional block is, is ask yourself how many data sheets does it take to review that schematic. And ideally that number is one or two, but most of the time it's one. And so with this schematic right here, you know, I, I need one data sheet to review it. Um, I don't have to worry about where the signals are going. And the, the way that I do that is, again, through harnesses. So harnesses allow me to descriptively label, you know, that particular harness and glean what the function of that harness is off that label. Um, and, and net names that are understandable or descriptive of what the signal is. But by doing that, then I can create an essential black box uh, for all of those functional, functional elements that has input and output requirements, but the, the details of the functional block itself are essentially obscured to the rest of the design. One of the things I like about a design that's uh, set up in the schematic as functional blocks is when we import that into the PCB, 
each page is going to be uh, potentially a room if we click that option. And that's going to make the review of the placement a lot easier. And then we can also place each of those uh, rooms locally before we do a, a global placement. One, one thing I'd say about functional blocks. So in my job, uh, one of the most frustrating things is when I open up a, a design that an electrical engineer did previous to, to me being there. And I have to open up this design, and I get really frustrated when, as an electrical engineer, I'm trying to read schematics, and I can't understand the schematics. And what I mean by that, I, I assume the rest of you have experienced this, where I'm reviewing a schematic, and I can't understand why he did something. You know, or there's some intricate, you know, circuit adjacent to something that, that doesn't show up on the data sheet. So I am really a, a firm believer in design notes. And then furthermore above that, you know, a lot of times when you look at these functional blocks, uh, they're functional blocks with some variation in them. And so you can ask yourself, what is that variation and how can I document it? And it does not take that long uh, for me to put these tables in here that essentially show how, you know, on this, this is a charge management IC. And I've got various elements in this charge management IC that, that set the configuration for it. And yes, you know, if I have a good supplier link attached to this, I can pop the data sheet open. But if I just take, you know, a snippet of, the data sheet and show how those elements are selected. You know, it, it makes my life easier when I need to make changes, but it especially makes the life easier of, of the engineer down the road who has to open up this design and make changes to it. So on design notes, um, you know, these are, are the design notes that we use, and these are design notes that are gonna persist with the design. So I don't think I need to go into description of, of what the, the different design notes are, but I, I, I really like uh, you know, categorizing and bringing attention to what the type of design note is. Yeah, this is very helpful. I, obviously, in a situation like this, I'm, anything that's blue, I'm going to be reading. Things that are um, you know, for the programmer aren't going to be really that important to me as a designer, but... Uh, it's, it's very, very nice to have a schematic where this has been done, and it makes it much easier to decipher, you know, what's going to be critical information uh, for placement. There might be, you know, layout notes, like this has to be close, and, you know, keep this short, keep this matched, these kinds of things. Uh, you know, if, as much information as can be put into the schematic should be um, within reason. Yeah. So power distribution. This is something that we build in Visio. Uh, you know, for too many designs, I've opened them up, and it's it's really a mystery on how power is distributed across the circuit. And so, what this is going to show me is the exact chain of you know how the power is distributed across the board. Yeah, this is a very important part of any embedded system design or. The, you know, a complex design because how that power comes up is also going to be very critical to how you lay that out because we're going to take our power source and ideally put these, you know, arrange these different components in a way that, you know, power comes from one to the next to the next and it cascades into the areas of use. Um, without this tree, you have to kind of like put that together yourself and it's, it's very difficult. The other thing that this allows the electrical engineer to do is when he does this test plan for bring up, he's going to be bringing up these initial power sources first and then, and then the ones that cascade uh, further in. And it's much easier to, to do those test plans if you have something like this arranged. So uh, I can't encourage you enough to put this into your schematics or put something, you know, put Excel spreadsheet together where you're going to have this in your design. It makes it much easier for anybody working with the project to understand what the, the power bring up is and um, if there's, you know, timing that, you know, like there's usually some timing associated with how these come up and um, that helps you check uh, 
you know, those different circuits as well when you do a design review on them. And the other thing I'll just point out real quick up here is, is we have the voltage set points and the maximum current that, that the different power domains on this PMEC can support. Furthermore, I think it's really important to take that power distribution tree and look at all your sources in your sinks. And the spreadsheet, you know, I, I see too often uh, that we design to worst case. So what we do is, is we look at the, the maximum current supported on the individual rail, and that's what we design to. Uh, this will allow us to make sure that, that we are not over-designing our board uh, in, in very cost-sensitive applications. You know, more often than not, you're looking at, you know, how can you fit more onto the board? And what that means is, is you are reducing uh, power delivery, you know, traces to an appropriate level. You know, on the, the flip side, you're also looking at this and seeing are, are your traces wide enough uh, for what you need to deliver. And sometimes you can design to worst case. You know, and that does give you some flexibility down the road if you need to add uh, an additional element to a particular rail on your design. Yeah, um, one, one thing about that is like, um, this was an area where we found some differences. Uh, I had worked on a board where we had a uh, reference design from a supplier and then we were working on a design internally and we were told that we needed to meet you know the maximum power consumption and we did that and then we got the data from the supplier on their design and they didn't do that at all like they were at about a third of the um, trace width for the maximum power and, of course, we asked them, well, why did you do that? Well, that's not really on as long as you think it is, and it's not really, you know, drawing that. That's in case it's like a short-circuit situation, and we've got, you know, software that will turn that off if that happens. So oftentimes, by delving into the details, you can find out that you don't need to design as robustly, you know, a trace width as, as you might otherwise need. So... Just something to be aware of as you're going through your designs is like know what the corners are that you can, you know, trim. The other thing I'll just point out here real quickly is, you know, on, on a lot of PMEX, you're, you're able to change the, the program voltage. Uh, in addition, we have the power on sequence listed. So, you know, that kind of leads back to board bring up or test sequencing. You know, now I've got a document that I can refer to that shows me exactly how those power rails are going to come up, and then I can measure and see that those rails are coming up in that order. So connectors. Uh, you know, I, I work at a company where it's pretty typical to, to have engineers that have been working there for 30, 35 years. And they're not super crazy about hierarchical design. And they really get pissed when I show them an entire schematic sheet devoted to a connector. But invariably, that initial resistance, uh, I have yet to have an engineer who uh, you know, had initial resistance to this that didn't come around at some point. And the reason that I like devoting an entire page to a schematic or entire schematic page to a connector is because number one, it allows me to create that top level schematic. So now I can label you know, my schematics that are connectors and see them in the top level. But for EMI, EMC, this is this is your most critical point. You know, this is really where you have to pay attention. And I think too often, you know, and what this forces people to do is, you know, number one, it allows us when we're going through the design process to see if, if the inputs are, are adequately pr protected from a ESD perspective and a filtering perspective. But it also allows us, um, you know, to, to 
kind of push back on the engineer when we open one of these pages and all we see over here is, is the connector. Yeah, it, it, it also helps you co-locate those components next to that connector when you do bring it up the room. We'll have all those um, ESD components and filtering components right next to it and almost invariably those should be placed right next to the particular connector. Yeah, I, I've seen that way too many times where, you know, we have ESD protection uh, on a connector and someone places it two inches from that connector. Um, or farther. Or farther, <laughs> yeah. So this is back to, um, you know, showing harnesses and, you know, kind of showing, you know, with the the buses included in the harnesses. This is an old FPGA reference design from Altium. And there's some great stuff uh, that Altium did back when uh, they used to design hardware. And so if you go back and dig up some of these reference designs, you will see that, that they pretty much follow uh, a lot of the recommendations that, that I am making today, or that we're making today. And one of the things that, that I would advocate for is when you are bringing in your harnesses to your microcontroller, or your application processor, or your FPGA, is that you do not connect the harnesses to the, the FPGA or the micro or whatever it is, uh, because this gives you flexibility in, in changing that connectivity. So, you know, when, when you're um, laying something out and you want to change uh, from one side of the processor to another because it's going to greatly ease how you route things, or, you know, you want to pull another, you want to change the pin muxing to something, this will allow you to do that and not have to restructure everything. Yeah, if the part's set up to be pin swappable, you have to make sure that you don't take a wire from the pin swappable pin to another pin, leave it open like this, and then that's going to enable that pin swapping to automatically change when you invoke the pin swapping. So ERC, and uh, you know, we're not going to spend too much time on this, but what we'll just say is, is don't ignore your ERCs. Uh, this, this requires uh, you to set up some, some, well, to take full advantage of, of the ERC checks in Altium Designer, you have to set up your pin types. So when you create your schematic symbol, you have to, you know, you just can't use passive pins on all of your pins for your device. You have to use power pins, you have to use I.O. pins, you have to use open collector to really take advantage of the ERC check. Furthermore, when you go through and you compile your project and you get, you know, I think worst case scenario is, is someone's leaving errors. Uh, you are really asking for it if you leave errors. Uh, best case, well not best case scenario, but next case is that people are ignoring the warnings uh, and then obviously the best case is you clear them all out. And the way that you clear them all out is with selective suppression of specific ERCs. So I will go through my design for each one of these warnings and I will make sure that I'm okay with what it's warning me about and then I will put a selective ERC on that. And the way I, I indicate that, um, I put my generic ERCs with the X, but if you go to the properties for the ERC, you can change it to a checkbox. And I use checkboxes for the selective ERC suppression. Yeah, also, well, let, let's go into the next slide. So um, in, in Altium, the project options menu is the main page for where we transfer, where we set up the data to transfer to the PCB. So um, on the right-hand side, these are what's going to be reported. Um, there's a default uh, in Altium. If you have a single node pin, it's not going to tell you about that. The default 
is that it doesn't, is it's a no report. But typically I would want to be uh, warned about that because generally I shouldn't have any, if I'm naming a net on a pin, it's probably got to go to somewhere else. And it's probably going to be an error if it's not going somewhere else. So that would typically be one that I would turn on even though it's like a default to be off for reporting. The only thing I'll say about this is understand it. You know, I, I think this is one of those things that the majority of engineers I work with have no idea uh, about these settings and furthermore have never gone in and changed or look at them. Just spend some time opening this and, and understanding what a majority of them mean. Same thing with the, the connection matrix. So this goes back to that I.O. pin type. Uh, this is going to really show uh, how, you know, what is going to generate those warnings. This is probably the biggest source of warnings in your design. And some of these can be turned off. Uh, <coughs> but the ones that aren't, I would just say, you know, understand how to set this and what, what it's set to. Okay, so uh, when we set up a, a parameter set, the name of the parameter set is in red, but it actually has no impact on the functionality of that parameter set. It's the class name and the classes that are set up or the rules that are set up in that particular parameter that matter. So what we typically want to do is give that parameter set like a real name, like this one below says DRAM-clock, right? So um, the one up above isn't really going to tell us anything. Um, you can turn, you can toggle that on or off to see that. Um, sometimes you might just turn on the, the, the class name or something like that to display that. But th those are different options. But be aware that like, what's in the blue here is the super important part. And what's in the red is just a label. And don't, don't mix the two up because I see that as a pretty common error on schematics. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that you can do... Uh, when you're creating the, the parameter sets is you can create, well, I hate to say structured class, but, you know, it's essentially a, a structure of the class name. So this is part of the, the sub uh, class of my, my DRAM clock, but that's just part of the larger uh, class of my DRAM. And so that can really enable you to set up rules more elegantly in the, the PCB going with that type of structure, especially for something like DDR. Yeah, something that's complex. Like you might have like a 50 ohm designation, which is a wide group of buses, but it might be a specific DRAM bus, but you might have like four different buses that are all going to be part of that 50 ohm uh, single-ended net class. So we can use multiple classes within one parameter to help us better define our design. So one of the really, you know, so you can either attach those parameter sets directly to nets or you can use a blanket. And Blankets are going to be quicker. Yes. And easier. And so for large groupings, you know, this is where, again, uh, harnesses really help things out because I can group everything together in my harness. And I, I actually found one thing out about harnesses. Uh, I'll show you in a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm actually doing a step here. Uh, which is apparently unnecessary. So we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But going back to the way I used to do things uh, prior to doing this presentation is, uh, you know, this having the, the, the harness set up allows me to put that blanket on easily where if these signals are dispersed all around the processor, I'm trying to group things together. It can be more complex without a harness. So at this point, let's talk about how a blanket works. So on a net label like DDR-D8 there in the middle, the very lower left corner of that is the key point for that. But also on that you know, net uh, line that it's on, the end point of that is also a point. So if that box for the blanket includes the end point of the Net line, it's going, to, it's going to be in that blanket, or if it includes the net label itself. So you can set up a, you can set up a blanket and just have net labels in there, or you can just 
you know, use that blanket to catch the end point of a particular net. And both of those would, in, you know, include that entity in the, in the blanketed glass. So one thing, one mistake that I've seen happen a number of times, and I've, it's happened to me, is the, you know, like Carl said, the key point for the net name is right here. And if my blanket just went down to the grid, which would align with this wire, and so it would be on top of that hot point, this bottom net, you know, if I just went down to here, would not be included in that blanket. Yeah, it has to be enclosed, not just touching. Yeah, so that's why I go one past, at least one past with the, the blankets. So differential pair naming, you have to have the differential pair directive, but you also have to label your nets with underscores. This is the only place in net labeling where I use that underscore, and I'm even a little bitter about having to use it here. Uh, the, the problem with underscores, and one of the first things I do is if I get a design that has underscores in the net name, I do the find replace and replace all of the underscores with uh, hyphens. And the reason I do that is because you can see here, this, these are all I did here is I deleted the wires, but you can see that the, the wire completely obscures the, the underscore. Yeah, it disappears. Also, there's a super big danger in Altium of using spaces in your net names. If you have a net name with a prefix that's the same prefix as another net name that has a different suffix, and you have a under, you know, if you have a space, Altium rejects everything after the space. So when it does its net listing, you'll combine those two uh, entities into one. You know, don't use spaces in your net names. Like it's really bad if you see them like replace them with an underscore or a dash or something. Um, but you're asking for a lot of problems if you have spaces in net names. They generally should not be allowed at all. I want you to talk about this because this was, this was an area where we, I generally, well, I'll do this sometimes, but I don't, I think you use it a lot more than I do. Yeah, so on width constraints, um, obviously there's an error in this width constraint because the max is, 10 mil and the min is 100. So, um, you know, what we want to have is a tolerance where, you know, if I'm going to go into a pin that's 10 mils wide, then I'd like to have the minimum set to, set to that. Uh, if I have a, I, I generally like to have the maxes a lot larger. Maybe that's not what I'm going to need, but maybe I'm going to want to use a wide, real wide trace to go into a connector or something. Um, generally, it doesn't hurt us in our designs if a trace is wider than it needs to be. Um, but that preferred width would, you know, be what we typically try to route with yeah. if the engineers put that on. So when I, I said I don't generally use these, I absolutely use width constraints. Um, but this is a method for setting up a design rule in the piece, or I'm sorry, in the schematic. And in general, as, as Carl said in his keynote yesterday, you can define unary uh, rules in the schematics and binary rules in the generally in the, the PCB itself, in the rules manager. So this is um, a great place to understand, and, and I'm guilty of this, and this is where I was talking recently about how I had an additional step in my harnesses. So understand, you know, there's some great features on this set of the project options that allow you to generate classes in your PCB. Um, the extra step, and I found this out when I was doing this screen clipping and, and looking at this again, maybe it's a new feature they added, but I kind of doubt it. Uh, is I can generate net, cl net classes for name signal harnesses. So, you know, I couldn't do that hierarchical, well, actually I probably could um, if I did harnesses in a harness, but going back to this one right here, uh, apparently I don't even need to put the blanket and the parameter set on that. So I could generate the net class from this name right here. Just by checking that other box on the yeah. other menu. 
You have anything you want? No, I think we covered that. Again, you know, this is set up right now to generate the component classes and generate the rooms, and then those are going to be real critical for us as we look in the PCB panel under the components tab to have to have you know the components on a particular schematic page. Um, that's going to help us with placement and also checking placement. And then, you know, having the rooms be generated is also going to be very helpful for us in the placement phase. So um, I'm just curious, show of hands, uh, how many people do a BOM review in between schematic and PCB layout? So about 5%. How many people do a BOM review at the end of the project before they're about to ship it out to manufacturing? Uh, about 95%. Okay. So... I think it's really important to do a BOM review before you have laid out your PCB, uh, especially, you know, I've, I've uh, over the past two years, uh, we have, and I, I think you've all experienced this, you know, we, we select a, a capacitor and there's 100,000 of them or a million of them. Uh, we select that capacitor, and then we go to order the boards, and they're gone. A million of them, yeah. and they're gone. Yes. Uh, the, but the other thing that, that you know, so I am going to see, uh, has anything changed on, on the life cycle of my parts? And so am I about to design in a part that has gone end of life? And sometimes on these bigger projects, the, the point between when you've selected a part and when you're going to lay it out, parts go into life. The other thing that I can do in Active Bomb, which I really like, is using the, the group by, I can group all of my parts uh, by, and what I've done here is I've, I've grouped them by value and by package. And so what I noticed in, in this review right here is I've got two uh, 18 picofarad uh, capacitors on my, my design, but I've got one in a 0201 and one in a 0402. And so now I can start you know, consolidating those and do it in a pretty rapid fashion. So the key things that you get from doing a bomb review after schematic is you're able to check uh, component availability with the component life cycle information and then also uh, do a a review of your parts to make sure that you're not increasing your bomb arbitrarily, right? Yeah. So pre-layout simulation. So I use a tool. Well, I use I use hyperlinks, um, and what I use hyperlinks to do is I take all of my critical buses. And I simulate them in hyperlinks prior to laying out a, a printed circuit board. And why am I doing that? Well, because what I'm going to do, and this might be pre-layout, or it might be after I've got a rough approximation of, of where my parts are on the board. And the reason it might be after I've done kind of my initial placement is because there's two things that I need to evaluate crosstalk. I need to know how close my traces are together, and I need to know the parallel length. And then, well, and then I need to know the rise time of, of the signals. And so by doing this pre-layout simulation, this allows me to create rules that actually mean something. And so when I go in, and I create my clearance rules for these buses, it's based on something uh, that you know, I've, I've simulated and understood. So now I know, you know what my noise margins are, and this allows me to space my traces so that my crosstalk is at an acceptable level. One of the other things that we do um, and, and we're going to talk about this in kind of the important decisions and discussions. But one of the things that we do prior to, um, this is again kind of, kind of in between schematics and start a PCB layout, but it could also happen a little bit later in the design process. But what we like to do is simulated drop testing 
Uh, and we do this with a company called DFR who was bought by ANSYS. And what this allows for me to see is the stress and the strain that's put on my, my printed circuit board during a drop event. As opposed to winging it, getting the circuit boards in, having to create some kind of assembly that you know, approximates uh, what the, the end enclosure might be. So for instance, in a plastic enclosure, you know, I might not go for steel cut tools at this point, but I might use aluminum uh, tools and build a case and drop it. But what I'm saying is you can simulate this. And you can see, you know, by the, the dimensions of the board and where I've chosen to put my mounting features, the stress and the strain that's put on the board. And if you can do this, and especially on a, a you know, board like this where uh, our board fabrication on this on a quick turn is 28 days, uh, in addition to you know, the assembly after that. So if we screw this up, we've lost a, at least a month and a half worth of, of time. Uh, furthermore, those, those boards are not cheap in prototype quantities. But the other thing about drop testing is it's a black box. I mean, I can't put little cameras in there and see exactly what's happening when I drop my device. But by doing this, I can see what's happening and then make intelligent decisions about how I'm going to address uh, that stress and that strain. You know, in, in some place that you... Um, really have to be careful about is, is BGAs. So BGAs um, are not super me mechanically robust, uh, but there are solutions to that. So you can use underfill or you can corner stake uh, the printed circuit board, I mean, sorry, the BGA. Uh, but this is a good thing to be aware of. You know, if, if you look at it at this step, you can make decisions about, you know, do I want to put another mounting hole right here and support the board better in that location? So again, just showing a different view of that simulation. So now uh, we're going to talk about uh, important decisions and discussions that need to happen at this point. So, um... When we are building our board, we want to design for the lowest cost typically. And one of the best ways to do that is, you know, reduce board size, but also reduce the number of assembly steps that are going to be required. So by reducing the different number of steps, that's going to give us the greatest cost reduction. So um, if we're going to put parts on, you know, one side of the board, um, that's going to generally give us a lower cost and a faster turn time because it's one operation for one side. A higher yield because we're not going to be targeting, you know, two different soldering operations. Fewer thermal excursions. The parts are more likely to last longer. And, you know, our bottom layer, um, you know, it will be free for routing, you know, other traces uh, without stubs because we can bring a via down over and up without incurring a stub. Um, it's also going to be, have some disadvantages. Um, if we only can put parts on one side, we might not be able to design as dense a package uh, as we would if we had parts on both sides. Um, decoupling capacitors are going to be harder to place if we do have like a BGA that requires those components to be real, very close to the pins. And it might mean a little bit larger PCB. Um, now, if, that some of the double-sided, you know, placement advantages are exactly the opposite. We might get a smaller PCB for a particular group of components, a higher density design. Uh, our decoupling caps can go right where we need them. Our connector placement, you know, maybe we can put parts on both sides or have a connector on both sides. So there's trade-offs for each of these. Uh, it might be a slightly higher cost to assemble a second side of the board. Um, a lo slightly longer lead time uh, for prototypes, uh, maybe a slightly lower yield. 
uh, as we put more stress on the parts during assembly. Again, we have to take all these factors into consideration and look at what our overall you know, goal is. Like when we looked at cost, scope, schedule, and quality initially, this is where one of the areas where that's going to play out in our decisions on uh, placement and routing are going to make a big difference for us. So I just want to hit on this a little bit more uh, and explain what, I, what we mean by that. So, I mean, and you don't necessarily have to have the, the bottom side of the board free of components to do this, but this was a little tip that I threw in is, you know, if, if you're routing a high-speed signal, the best way to avoid a, there's two ways that I use to avoid uh, via stubs. And one of them, I, I do not like back drilling. It's expensive, it's unreliable. But the two ways that you can avoid a via stub is when that signal transitions, you transition it all the way to the bottom of the board. And then you can route out and use your, your bottom three layers as a high-speed signal pair. So what that means is that the outer layer signal, you've got ground, and then you've got a signal layer again. And the way you, after that, avoid via subs is through laser-drilled microvias. But by bringing it all the way down from the top side, I don't have a stub. I think that makes sense. And furthermore, by using that as a high-speed pair, what I mean by that is I can go from the outer layer to the you know inner signal layer and I'm referencing the same ground plane. But when I make that transition from top to bottom, I need to have a stitching via um, you know close to where I've made that transition between the different ground planes that that signal references prior and after that transition. But best, of course, is going to be to route that high-speed net on the same layer, start and end on the same layer yeah. with the same ground plane reference. Yeah. Yeah. That's always going to be the best. But yeah. um, given the complexity and geometry of our boards, we're very rarely allowed to do that. Yeah. One thing I'll say is, is um, how many people here use laser-drilled microvias? Okay. Uh, laser-drilled microvias are a cheap cost increase to your board if you use them for one layer. So in general, you can get laser-drilled microvias from one to two, and then the bottom layer to the next inner layer for a very small cost adder to your board, as long as the, the dielectric thickness supports an aspect ratio of one or less. So that generally means you have to have a, a dielectric thickness of less than five mils between those layers, but you can add laser-drilled microvias, and it really gives you a lot of flexibility in your design. So um, that way, if you want to like bring a, like let's say your second layer is ground, and you want to ground that particular thing, you just put a laser via to ground, boom, done. Um, the reason it's less expensive is you haven't added sequen a sequential lamination step. When we do sequential lamination boards, that means they're basically building a board, building another board, and then laminating those two boards together. And that tends to be a very expensive uh, cost adder, whereas a single lamination cycle with uh, a, a laser drilling is, you know, you're, on you're only taking the time to put it into the laser drilling, and it's typically very fast to laser drill. Um, you can drill a whole panel of laser drilled vias in one or two seconds, whereas a mechanical drilling operation, you know, might, might take 15 or 20 minutes. It's much, much cheaper to do the laser vias. So these are the, the two technologies that are kind of at the opposite ends of the spectrum. Uh, and they are actually the biggest cost adders to the assembly process. So through-hole parts are a huge cost adder. I mean, unless your, your entire board is through-hole, which... Pretty rare these days. Pretty rare. Um, but if you're doing mixed technology and you're doing surface mountain through-hole parts on your board, you know, that... that 
So when we do have a mix of technologies, we have to um, be aware of our placement constraints. So if I have through-hole parts on my top, and I don't have any through-hole parts on my bottom, but I want to um, design as densely as possible, and I've got surface mount parts on both sides, well, typically that means we're going to have a fixture in order to be able to wave solder those um, through-hole parts. And that means that I need to have like a five millimeter gap from any of those pins to a surface mount component or the edge of a surface mount component. Um, with a custom uh, fixture, I can get that down to three millimeters, but generally a five millimeter clearance is gonna be the lowest cost fixture. And uh, so what, in placement, that means I'll be able to place more parts on the top than I would on the bottom. Because on the top, I can bring a surface mount part right up to the edge of that through hole part uh, courtyard, but on the bottom, I need to have room for a fixture to keep that surface mount part protected while, while it goes over wave solder. So um, who's using fixtures on their designs right now? I'm just curious how many people are aware of this problem. So actually very few, but in high volume manufacturing, that's a very typical way of solving the problem is to put a, basically you're building a cover for all the surface mount parts as you send the board through, you know, a wave soldering operation. Yeah, and I'd, I'd say a couple of things about this is, for me, generally the only time I'm using a, a through-hole part is for a connector. And if that connector is going to have multiple insertion cycles, you cannot rely on a, a surface mount part. Yeah, it's not as reliable. It doesn't have as much grip on the yeah. printed circuit board. Even if it has stakes, it's not mechanically as strong as a through-hole part. So, you know, I don't see through-hole parts going away for connectors anytime soon. No, no. But the, the solution to through-hole, you know, connectors is then what I can do in my assembly process is I can do selective soldering. Uh, and we'll, we'll show that a little bit later. Uh, the other thing is, is BGAs. But in particular, if you're getting down to a 0.5 millimeter pitch BGA or a 0.4, these are going to drive up your layer count. And the reason is that now we have to go to uh, microvia, and we probably have to go to a sequential lamination microvia um, because the pitch doesn't allow for any routing to take place between the balls on the BGA. And it won't allow for any b balls, uh, even in the lower layers, to break out through that same pitch if we've had to drop vias there. So we have to do a fan out from the balls into, uh, like it's a tree. As it comes down away, you lose a layer, but you, you, you have to fan it out. So um, it's, it's much more challenging to do fine pitch BGA. They drive up layer costs and they can add to your overall board cost. So it's an initial design decision that the electrical engineer needs to evaluate whether you know, the availability or cost of that part is going to be an overall improvement in the total cost of the design and the total headache you have with it, you know, as far as, you know, layout. And the, the thing I'll say about uh, this becomes a very tough nut to crack because, you know, on my, my outer rows, um, I can route out on my external layers, but as soon as I get into the internal rows, now I have to start going down. And the, the wall that you're going to come up against is do not do more than three sequential laminations. And so that is a long conversation with your board fabricator and then also figuring out your via structure and how to route these signals out. And it is a huge cost adder. Um, so like Carl said earlier, for those of you that haven't done sequential lamination, every time you are doing a sequential lamination, your costs are generally equivalent to about 30 or 40 percent is what I'm finding. What do you find? I, I find that it, I mean, if I have a board that, that costs me five dollars a board and I do one sequential lamination, we're up to nine dollars a board. Yeah, so yeah. that'd be, so you're getting almost 80 yeah. percent increase in cost. Yeah. Um, it's a significant cost adder. In, in particular, it's a significant time adder. So, you know, that board I was talking about earlier is uh, two sequential laminations. I gotta think about that for a second. Two or three, but that's why the turn time on it is so long. 
So this is what we were just kind of talking about. I mean, ideally you want all your circuit board for assembly going through a reflow oven. Um, you know, if you're doing combined technology, you're using wave soldering and reflow. And then if you've got a small amount of through hole parts, it makes sense to do selective, you know, this is a selective soldering machine. And it's essentially this in a little nozzle up here. Yeah, so that selective soldering technology is also going to be very useful if you have like a, a heavy pin or something with a high mass um, that's going to require a lot of heat to solder. Um, this would typically be the preferred way to, to solder like heavier connectors or pins or posts, something like that. Um, it might be the only way that you'd be able to solder it. Because or I guess the, one the thing capillary we did. action of the wave solder isn't going to bring uh, the 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 metal will cool before it gets up into the up into the hole column on a heavier part. The 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 mass of that part is going to cool the the small amount of solder. Usually a small hole, it'll it'll wick right up and it won't cool that solder off. Um, but it'll it'll stay in its molten state, you know, longer in a small hole than it will in a large hole. And I Just guess because of the mass involved. The one thing that we didn't show on here is the guy hand soldering at a bench. Yeah. So that's the, the fourth method. Okay, so um, here's a very uh, complex outline. And it's um, and what, what we see on the right is a 3D model that's been added to the design so that when you want to see if stuff's going to fit, you can you know, turn that and look at it and see. Now, um, when we bring the board outline in, typically for an outline like this, it's really complex. We'd like to have a DXF file and import that and then select it and, you know, make the outline from our board that way. And then, uh, but we can also use a, a 3D shape and create a board outline from, you know, one, one surface on a on a step file as well. So both of those are different ways to get your board shape, but my preference would always be the DXF file. Yeah, and this is, you know, um, I think Altium's done a great job of making this a, a much more straightforward process, and, and this is always a very time-consuming process for us, where it's a lot of back and forth with our MEs and, and shifting stuff and yeah, having uh, that 3D shape is, you know, awesome for designing, like, really compact parts that have a complex geometry around them. Like, we saw that shaper tool earlier today, um, very tight constraints in, in different areas. So having a 3D, you know, being able to import that 3D shape and look at it, you know, allows us to really do a better job of the packaging. Um, so a couple of different ways to treat that 3D shape. Uh, you can bring it right into the board or... You know, my preferred technique is to bring that shape into a part and then load the part onto the board and use, like, a mounting hole as, like, the locating pin on it. And then, um, you know, I'll have that 3D shape available to me. And then if I don't want the 3D shape in the way while I'm working on things, if I don't want it selected, then I'll offset it by, like, maybe a 1,000 millimeters off the edge of my board and work on the design, and if I want to do some checking, then I'll just take that part and slide it back and do a minus 1,000, you know, step on it to bring it right over the part again. Um, or if I can delete it and bring it back from the library pretty quickly, but usually I like to have it in the design space, but I don't want it there all the time. So, you know, I use that offset technique quite a bit. <clears throat> ah, board mounting. So, um... How many different ways are you mounting your boards today? Most common is probably screw the board down to a case, right? Um, that's probably the most common way, but there's lots of other ways. So uh, we've card slots where we slide it in, and it's going to be retained on, on the sides of that card and in maybe a lock position um, to, hold, to clamp it down or something. Um, mounting holes, grounded, ungrounded, this is always going to be a consideration electrically and mechanically, um, use of hardware that's, you know, metal, or maybe we use, you know, some non-conductive hardware. If we have some high voltages, we might choose to do that. 
Um, we also, uh, you know, like you see some Loctite on these. Uh, that might be another thing. You know, torque, torque control is very important on printed circuit boards. If you over torque your hardware, you can destroy your printed circuit board or create uh, fractures in it that would lead to calf uh, problems or other anoidic, you know, other problems like that. So. Mounting is a big deal, and then there's one that uh, Max likes to use. You mentioned uh, like a heat stake, right? Yep. And so you know we've used heat staking before. It's complicated, but that's essentially where you have a a plastic um, pillar coming up through the mounting hole, and then you mushroom it down uh, using a fixture. It 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 it's finicky, and it requires a lot of fixturing and expensive tooling. But it can get you to a, a point where uh, you don't need to have mechanical fasteners or uh, things that the mechanical fasteners will fasten into, whether it's the material or... Um, yeah, so thinking back of that earlier model, we saw like the vibration analysis, and we had that one point that was like a hot spot. Another solution to fix that might be to bring a stake up from that lower case, it's a molded case, and it's pretty free to bring up a stake that would, you know, offer some additional support to that area of the board without actually contacting any of the circuits. You know, as designers, we want to be thinking about the whole thing that we're designing, and, you know, we want to use all the tools at our disposal to get the, you know, the best product, the most reliable product. Yeah, and the, the other thing that I would say about uh, your mounting strategy is you have to start considering ESD dissipation and your EMI EMC. And, and I think Henry Ott does a, a great job of uh, talking about this in his book, Electromagnetic Compatibility, and the different variations you can have on, on how you ground your circuit board uh, at your mounting hole locations. There's a hybrid ground. Uh, there's a direct connection, and both have ad advantages and disadvantages and, and applications in different areas. Uh, it would be too long for us to kind of dive into that, but I think it's, it's really worth looking at uh, because there is not, you know, if someone tells you ground all your mounting holes directly to the case if you've got a metallic enclosure, in some cases you do, in some cases you don't. Some cases you make that connection through a capacitor for all of your mounting holes, except for the ones adjacent to your primary connector coming in that has a safety ground that's attached to your case. Another thing at this point to consider would be the uh, assembly operation order. So this board's pretty simple. It's one board going into an enclosure, but typically we might have multiple boards, multiple enclosures, multiple cabling, and we need to think of the sequence of assembly. So if you haven't thought about it as a board designer, you're definitely, like the mechanical engineer that's on the team, needs to think of that sequence of operations to actually assemble the product. So, you know, if you look at, you know, something as complex as like a, a cell phone, you know, there is a lot of engineering that, that goes into how this is put together. If you open it up, you'll see, you know, a lot of things that just nest together and fold together and overlap. And, you know, the, the sequence of each connector insertion and the sequence of each, you know, screw that's put in, you know, there should be a plan for that. And if you haven't thought about it, then at least your mechanical engineering team should have thought about it. I mean, just a really simple tip. Do not use uh, different size screws unless you have to, unless you want your manufacturing people pissed off at you. Uh, that's a, yeah, we definitely want similar sized hardware. You know, it, it simplifies the operation. You can imagine, you know, if there's two boxes of bolts, chances of grabbing the wrong one are a lot higher. You know, as designers, we want to reduce failure modes, and how we design is going to, you know, pay, play a big part in that. So PCB test strategy, um, this is, again, a, a topic that, that I think we could spend an entire day talking about. But generally, uh, you know, this is your fail-safe. I don't even want to say fail-safe, but uh, this is flying probe. 
And this is the test strategy that you're going to use most likely if you haven't thought about your test strategy. Uh, so, you know, but there are other times where you're going to use this because of various other reasons. So, um, are you referring to bare board or assembled board at this uh, point? Assemble board. Okay, so typically, Flame, yeah. So, you know, typically you will do flying pro bare board tests to ensure continuity. I would highly. Who orders your boards here without getting continuity checks on them? Zero hands went up, good. Um, uh, you know, generally, we all want to work on boards we know are, that are known good, so we use, you know, flying probe for bare board testing, and they generally can extract the data from the ODB file or the Gerber file to do that. However, keep in mind that um, if it's not a netlist-based test, you're just checking against what might be a known bad board. Like if they say, you're, if your golden board is bad and you check everything against it, then it just ensures that all boards are bad. Um, so be aware of that and usually require like a netlist test on the bare board testing. I've, yeah, once a board's assembled, this is a more expensive way to test. Let's go on to the next slide. So, you know, this is a clamshell test. We got probes coming up and down onto the board. And um, this would be one of the more expensive uh, test solutions. A fixture of this size might be in the ten to fifteen thousand dollar range, typically. Um, I think you wanted to talk about this device on the left. Yeah. So this is. Well, let me let me just add a little bit more to you know this discussion right here. One of the discussions that we have often when we're doing the schematic capture is is what nets do I need test points on? And if you are not space constrained, uh, you know, ideally you are putting test points on every net in, in your design. Now, the, the designs that I work on, I don't have that luxury. But I still use that as what I am accomplishing when I am coming up with my test strategy. And what I mean by that is I might not have the space on my board to put a test point for every, every node on my, my, my board. So how do you get around that? Like what would be your key strategy for not using a node on every test point? So we're doing a mixture of functional and direct testing of specific nets. And so what I mean by that and, and kind of back to what I was saying about, you know, testing everything on the board. So critically, the things that I want to test on a board are my voltages and my currents. And so if I have to reduce my test points to absolute bare minimum, those are the things that I'm looking at. So I'm looking at are my voltages at the points where they need to be for critical power supplies, and are my devices drawing an appropriate amount of current when in a specific condition? Yeah, that, so that's a key point. When you're doing test points for assembly test, high voltage nets or you know high current draw nets during tests are going to be using the amperage that that device needs to use. So if it's using several amps, then we usually need to get about a half amp per test point. Um, so we might need on a 10 amp circuit, we might need like 20 points on that. And we might need like 30 ground, you know, uh, test points on a particular design if it's using a lot of current. So um, for high current nets, we definitely want to have multiple um, uh, assembly test points on yeah. it. And then from there, I'm going to, to higher level functional tests of sub circuits on my board. But what I want to do when I'm doing that is I want to make sure that those functional, um, and this is, a, again, hard to explain in a, a condensed form, but I want to make sure that when I'm testing that, that sub-circuit on my board or that sub-function that is, that is inferring complete functionality of everything that's up-chain and down-chain from that. Yeah, so there's, um, so when you do a functional test, you can have a test point on every node and check all the components that way. But oftentimes we're 
limited in space. And one of the ways to reduce the number of test points needed is to look at what's a programmably uh, testable point in like a JTAG. Uh, we might be able to ping a particular component on the board and then have it, uh, pro, you know, have it uh, run an analysis of what it connects to. And that, that'll typically save a lot of uh, test point coverage. Sometimes we can reduce the test points that are needed by 30 or 40 percent. And now instead of spending 10 or 15 thousand dollars on this test point, we might be able to bring that fixture cost down, you know, by, you know, five thousand dollars or something, bring it into maybe the five or ten thousand dollar range. Just by, you know, just by changing our test point strategy. So mo most uh, large volume assembly manufacturers are going to point you in that direction anyway, but it's definitely something you want to be aware of as designers. And one thing I'll just say really quickly, and I seem to get feedback when I stand over there. Uh, one thing I'll just say is, is in coming up with your test strategy, uh, something you want to think about early is how are you testing your radio links on your board? And this is a device that we've used uh, from LightPoint. But this also means that I have to have RF boxes uh, with my ICT and my test fixturing at my, uh, for my, my printed circuit boards. This is something, this is just a quick tip and trick that, that um, I think is a, a great thing to do on, um, well, and I'm, this was recommended be, to me by a company that we work with, F3. Uh, previously for antenna characterization, what we would do is we would, you know, disconnect the, the RF transceiver, and then we would solder on a coax, and it looks like this butcher job, and then we do the antenna characterization in an anechoic chamber with, you know, rotating plate, or rotating fixture, and by putting in this U.FL connector, you know, so here's my radio that I put in here. I can take my radio off, and now I've got a really easy way with zero ohm resistors to hook up uh, this for antenna characterization. And what I'll say about this really quickly is, is if you are designing an antenna and you are doing it using only equations, and that's what you go to market with, you are doing it wrong. So, you know, equations are a good starting point and simulations are a good starting point, but you need to characterize your antenna in its final enclosure. And just because something's RF transparent, like plastic, it does not mean that it is not loading your antenna. So if you put something into a plastic enclosure, it is changing the characteristic of your antenna and you need to characterize uh, that antenna and restructure your matching network accordingly. And we generally utilize an outside service to do that because it is a fairly complex uh, process. Hopefully this isn't your board. So you should be discussing thermal strategy. I mean, prior to doing layout, how are you getting the heat out of your device? Uh, if you are using active or passing cooling, how are you interfacing those with your, your device? Which components on your board need this cooling? Um, and how are you going to interface that with your enclosure? Yeah, and how do you know the right information? Well, if you go back to the schematic earlier, Max had a thermal chart, and that was the wattage of dissipation for each of his main components. And we need to look at whether or not we can do that actively or passively. So passively, uh, we can put you know, a copper shape down on a part. We can pull vias to the planes and get, get heat away that way. Or you know, if it's a large uh, component that's dissipating a lot of heat, then we'll typically put you know, some active cooling on it where we'll uh, have either fans in the enclosure that are drawing air across it or actually a fan, you know, that's right on a heat sink like we see here in the lower right where we'll, you know, actively be placing that. Or we might uh, have some, you know, uh, some cooling ports that, you know, or to a cooling plate that, you know, we're, we're you know, using thermal paste to bring all of those components right to that uh, liquid cooling solution. So, uh, 
thermal management in high you know performance systems is a very very big part of, of design today if you open up your laptop computer you're very likely to see you know heat pipes and active cooling in there but um, passive cooling tends to be a lot less expensive um, so that would you know usually our, be our first option but sometimes the lowest cost is to you know reduce your overall geometry and have active cooling and you know put that uh, you know bring that heat out to you know a radiator somewhere else in in the system where it's going to be able to dump that heat so shielding uh, in general, if, if you, know, you have a, a intentional radiator on your board, you need to think about shielding. But shielding is, is a multi-pronged approach. It is not throwing a metal box down on your printed circuit board. Uh, shielding consists of the metal box. It consists of your, your board stack up and how that metal box interfaces to your board stack up in your via structure. And it consists of filtering the signals that come in and out of that, that box. Because you will completely undo your shielding if you haven't done an adequate job of filtering the I.O. that come in and out of that shielded <coughs> box. So, so the size of the ports in your shield are frequency dependent, right? That sine wave is uh, energy, and it, we want to... Any gap in our shield needs to be less than one quarter wavelength uh, in space. So, um, at different frequencies, we'll have different size shields. Well, you know, if we put a perimeter of vias around our board for uh, EMI protection, the gap between those vias is going to be dependent on what you know frequencies we want to be able to mitigate. So, um, you know, you should always be asking, what's the fastest, you know, speed uh, signals that we have on the board and then you know design your um, your shielding uh, around that so that you know that's that's definitely like a part of the engineering we have to do ESD mitigation so Shocking. yes uh, the uh, was actually kind of a good joke I don't think anybody caught it um, so ESC mitigation, so we showed that schematic of connectors and talked about how important it is to have ESD uh, TVS diodes adjacent to those connectors. But you, you have to think about where that, that ESD current is going. So just putting an ESD diode on a connector and connecting it to ground and saying that you're done with it, that is going to work sometimes and other times it's it's not going to work at all um, especially in in portable devices uh, ESD wants to return to ground the ground okay not not your circuit ground you can't shunt it to the ground of your circuit and then be done with it and the way it does that is it capacitively couples to ground so you have to look, and, and you'll look at a lot of handheld devices, and if they have exposed electrical contacts on them, what you will notice about those devices is there are metal plates in those devices. And those metal plates capacitively couple to ground, and that is where they are shunting their ESD current to. So handheld calculators... There's a metal plate in those if they have, you know, through for ESD mitigation through the keyboard. Uh, again, Henry Ott has a great treatment of this in his book. The other thing that you can do, uh, your cell phone does not have a metal plate on it. In the case of your uh, lithium ion cell, is not a, a ground. So most lithium ion cells keep their outside case at the, the positive potential of the cell um, for chemistry reasons. And, but the, so the, the way that most cell phones do this is they don't have exposed electrical contacts. So if your electrical contacts are recessed, then you're, you're you're not completely getting away from it, 
but then you only have to pass the air discharge tests when you're going through ESD testing. Oh, and the other thing I would say is, is if you've got a safety ground and a chassis, you want to dump your ESD onto that and back through your safety ground. All right, so when we bring our uh, schematic into the board, this would be a typical way it would look. We'd have a bunch of rooms, and we have a bunch of components that are just loosely arranged, not in any particular order. Um, generally, this is how we bring in most of our boards, right? So um, what do you do after you get it like this? Well, you look at it, and you're like, okay, see there's a lot of traffic between that memory and the the uh, BGA, and then there's a lot of, you know, traffic between, you know, that BGA and, and a bunch of IOs, uh, you know, like a lot of the small resistors, which are probably our, you know, RCs and things like that. Um, but generally what we're going to want to do is now take this, and then I think our next slide shows some locally clustered stuff. Um, sort of. Not really. Um, what, what we'll do is we'll take each of those um, rooms and we'll locally place those rooms, and depending on how dense our board is, there's a couple different strategies for placement. So if I have a super dense board, I know everything's going to barely fit on there. So um, one thing we can do quickly is, like, let's go to that next sl slide. So in this case, we've taken all that, and we've just said, you know, uh, TOL, put it all in one box, right? How much room does it take and when all the parts are next to each other? And then look at that compared to how much room we have on our board. So if this takes 100 square inches and I have a um, 10 by 10 board and uh, that's 100 square inches or, you know, like 40 millimeter um, for my German audience here. Um, so I'm going to look at the percentage of components to the board area. If it's 50% or lower, that's generally considered fairly low density. Every 10% gets about 10% harder. So if I go to 60%, now I can still do that all parts on one side. As I go up uh, to 100% uh, and all the parts have to be on one side, then that's going to be a very, very difficult design if it's all component to component because I don't leave any room for vias. I don't leave any room for buses or any of that routing. So generally, we like to not go above 80 or 90% uh, component placement area to the board real estate. Um, if you get above 90%, then that's really super hard, and generally you're going to spend an inordinate amount of time routing that board if you can even finish it. Um, that's definitely an expert level design if you're at that kind of density. And generally, we d even experienced designers aren't going to try that if they don't have to. Um, so, you know, initially we want to use like a calculation just to gauge where we're at and this could be done as soon as the schematics are done or even partially done you can do an area study and see you know are, am I in the right ballpark or am I designing myself into a corner right away and the 70 percent to 80 uh, percent utilization of the area that's generally a pretty good sweet spot for you know reasonable density and reasonable routing you know uh, solvability so let's go on to the next slide. So as we, you know, look at the different uh, placement options, so I, I, as I was saying earlier, there's a couple main placement strategies. One would be, um, you know, we're always going to place our fixed components first, but then after that, uh, we have a choice of either, you know, kind of, we want to, we want to like conceptualize where the main blocks are. So how should our power supply come in? We generally want to have all our power supply and filtering and power reduction from the source of that power and keep that close. Because that's going to be a fairly noisy part of the board. We want to mitigate that and have its return path to the main ground right away so that our digital and sensitive analog components aren't going to be influenced by that. And then we want to look at you know, co-locating uh, parts that should be co-located. So when we looked at the very first slide today, it was the overall um, drawing that showed, you know, the, the global view of the board in a hierarchical fashion. And I'm going to want to be able to place those hierarchical blocks. Co I'm going to co-locate them so that they don't influence each other and they aren't influenced by anything else, especially 
anything that's got high speed, like the DDR3 memory should generally be away from everything else, maybe into one corner or edge of the board. It's typically the way that you design that and then have its power supply be you know, adjacent to it, but not too far away for the local power that it's going to be, be provided, but then keep the main power you know, farther away and then any analog components that are going to be sensitive to um, changes. We, we also want to be very careful how we, how we route those. And then, you know, p making sure that we have our bypass capacitance close to where it's needed. And then also, now bulk capacitors don't necessarily need to be close, but the smaller value caps are pretty much useless if our, uh, you know, if we don't have them close. Um, and then, and then any you know RC termination, we need to make sure that we're putting it at the right end of of the of the network. You know, typically it's going to be by the processor, but not always. Um, anything you want to add to that? I'll just say quickly that you know, and that was interesting to hear that we both kind of take the same approach. I'll take those little functional blocks, and I will lay them out, or, or not lay them out. I'll arrange them, and then I will bring them onto the board kind of individually. But one of the things that um, I did early in my career is uh, I, I placed things on my board in the optimum placement. And so this resulted in, in a lot of stuff that was, you know. You might have an odd shape, right? Well, you yeah, know, but mixed. Like, and, yeah. Then, and then I would say, you know, what I've evolved into is, yes, I try and get thing as, things as optimum as possible. But I also keep things kind of organized um, and grouped together on my printed circuit board. And this, I mean, yeah, this is just stock. That, uh, I want to add one thing to that. So also have in mind, if you're going to do a single-sided placement, you know, where all the parts are on one side, or a double-sided placement, because it's going to greatly influence how you do those local blocks. Yeah, so I would, you know, this does a pretty good job of showing it. But, you know, having components organized, you know, capacitors and and kind of arrays on the board, um, not compromising, you know, signal or power integrity to do that, but kind of in a structured way and how things are organized on the board. And There's our functional block. Yep. You know, from the top level schematic. So, um, so after we've got our parts placed, there's going to be specific signals that we really care a lot about. Almost always it's going to be like your differential pairs because that's going to be your high-speed data, you know, in a serial bus. Uh, typically, differential pairs are how we're transferring data. Um, high-speed USB or, you know, um, Ethernet uh, are also going to be differential pairs. And then, so, um, and then we have the clock lines, like a you know, spy bus is very typical on a circuit is to have, you know, like a spy bus. So... Um, those signals need to, be, need to be treated just as critically as any other clock signal. And we want to make sure that, you know, we keep uh, ground next to those. And any time we transition from one layer to another, we want to have a ground via near those, like, spy bus signals, you know, misi, mosi. Uh, you know, like, those are the signals that are very critical to us as far as timing. And if we have a problem on those, we have a problem that the board, you know, at is going to be, you know, not those. Those are very hard problems to mitigate. So we want to take particular attention to those and keep other signals, you know, maybe two or three times uh, farther away from those as we would with the rest of the signals. So set up your differential pair rules, and the way you set up your differential pair rules is you set up your your stack up, and you work with your board fab house. You work with a good board fab house, and you get your impedance tables. And that is how you set up the rules for your differential pairs. Um, I'm a big fan of, of the calculators, whether it's Altium um, or other calculators that are available online, get you in the ballpark. But for your final widths um, and you know dielectric spacings and how that affects your impedances, you need to work with your, your board fab house. Don't change them in the middle of your design flow. And this is another thing that I do is, is I take this, which is generated by the board fab house, and I put it back into the schematics. Because I want to show, well, just it gives me a way to check 
You know, I mean, setting up the, the board stack up is easy to make a mistake. It's easy to make a mistake in, in setting up the rules and putting in the wrong value. And this allows me to go back and, and see, you know, what was the basis of, of setting up those rules or my stack up. So here we have a fairly complex uh, split plane um, on the left that we're viewing. And then we um, have a fairly complex 16-layer board uh, stack up. Um, and then, you know, with, the, with this, uh, you, know, we've, you know, we'll be able to use this for our controlled impedance nets with the new version. You know, as of version 19, we have, you know, the ability to set up um, our differential pairs and our single-ended, you know, controlled impedance nets right in the PCB stack up. We can set up a property for those. And then, uh, Vince, are you going to show that to us? Okay, so we're almost at the point where we're going to switch over and go to a little bit of a demo, right? Yeah. And then, um, yeah, so... And I, I just realized I never looked at the stack up to see if it was a good stack up, but uh, I just got this out of a reference design. But we wanted to show, you know, some of the capabilities that are available in Altium Designer now. The stack up visualizer, um, you know, as in, in setting up your rules, and, and I hope we get a chance to look at this in the demo, uh, you know, we can also, this is the point at which we're going to set up our X signals. Uh, you know, a, a critical step, you know, kind of prior to this, we need our, our characteristic impedances, and then we're going to set up essentially our, our physical timing requirements for our printed circuit board using our X signals. Yeah, X signals will allow us to get um, data for specific parts of a signal. So typically, the PCB net is going to report out the whole net length, but if we need to have like a length match for like the source to the branch and then from the branch to the destination, that's where we would use X signals to get that information and be able to, to view it and see it in a report. Uh, in the X signal panel. Um, design classes, of course, are how we're going to keep track of all of this. I think we already covered design classes. Yeah, we, we covered design classes. I will just say, you know, in the most of our design classes are set up in the schematic, but there are a portion that I'm setting up manually in the PCB. And one of those that I use frequently is pad classes. Uh, so I will have a pad class that has a direct uh, polygon connection as opposed to a thermal relief polygon connection. I'm using that for, um, for instance, a polygon that I use on my switching node of my high power switching power supply. You know, I won't thermally relieve, relieve those because there isn't enough copper mass in that polygon to justify thermally relieving it. So I'm going to share a technique that I use using classes. So um, when I'm designing a board and I need to put assembly test points on it, I can run a DRC report and then I can select everything, every net that doesn't have a, a, uh, a, an ICT pad on it um, because it'll fail in the report for the assembly test point. Now that it's selected, I can go into create pad, create net class, create a net class of all the nets that don't have an ICT on them and build a net class out of that, and then I can go in and selectively highlight all those. Um, when I turn them off, they're still masked compared to the rest, and then I can quickly assign like lots of test points and not have to um, like go back and one by one. I can just like you know look at a whole mass of the comp different nets that don't have uh, a test point and add them very quickly. So classes can be used in a lot of creative ways to help you you know, analyze your design and get through it faster. Uh, set up your design rules. Uh, this is something that um, is challenging for all of us. And yeah, it's, uh, it's probably not the most fun part of a design. Who who likes design rules the most? Not one <laughs> hand went up. Um, you know, like it's it's a necessary thing. Like we don't have a good board if we don't have good design rules. So like. You know, who wants a good board? Pretty much every hand should go up, right? Like, we all want good boards, but um, this is how we get there, so we go through this. And um, we look for the most efficient way to do it and the most effective, and beware of engineers that turn the rules off, because they will. And beware of PCB board designers if you're the electrical engineer 
always, you know, look and see what rules they have on and off as far as the rules to check. Like, that's really important because, you know, it might not be done when you think it's done if they've turned off the rules for it. All right, so that's it. Thank you. I, I realize it's the last day and, and everybody's getting tired, um, but we're going to have Vince uh, do a quick uh, demo here. Thank you. Do you need my microphone? I have um, a few minutes here to, do a, to, dem to demonstrate uh, some of the capabilities that, will, that Altian Designer offers that will embrace what uh, Carl and Max discussed. So what I've got here is, uh, got Altium Designer up. Let me make sure my mouse is working here. Okay, so uh, how many of you are using these uh, signal harnesses that, we've, that we have, uh, okay, let me. Not sure what happened here with the screen, let me. Let me go ahead. We need to duplicate. There we go. Okay. How many of you uh, are using those uh, signal harnesses that we talked about earlier? Okay, great, great. Uh, I just want to go ahead and just show uh, a couple of aspects. Where I'm going to sort of start from the foundations that, that Max and, and Carl went into and, and work through what we can. We, we're probably going to have uh, only, oh, I don't know, maybe eight to ten minutes on a demonstration here, and we will then open it up for questions. So here's an example of just being able to highlight some net names, and I can come in here and copy these. And um, I don't know if you've used Smart Paste. I know it's relatively new for me but it's uh, very interesting. You can actually then paste those net names and you have your whole harness made for you. So this is a great uh, thing to do if you're converting a flat design or you're, you wanna move to a higher level of organization, you can certainly do that with these harnesses. Um, how many of you uh, are, are do embedded software in C or something like that? Okay, not a whole bunch, but a few of you. You can think of these harnesses as like a standard function call because what's really cool about this is uh, I'll pop into this other design here is you can come in here and I can say, okay, I want to place a signal harness and I can go to define harness connector and as I enter in harnesses into a design, sort of like C functions, the system is going to recognize that structure. And then I can, I want to get a, a JTAG interface here. And I can simply just choose that. It's already in there because it's been entered before. And then come in here and place that. Okay, and then um, I can go to my top level. Uh, this is a hierarchical design. And I can go to my top level and I can come in here and go ahead and uh, uh, synchronize my sheet entries. And it sees that I've added that, that JTAG, uh, JTAG interface and I can, uh, can do that. And it puts it right here. And then I can simply wire this up. So that's very helpful, again, for those of you that may not be using those, those uh, lists of, uh, of hierarchy and such. Can I show you one quick thing? Sure. Um, so one tip I give. Um, let me see One tip I would give is when you're wiring over this signal harness here, uh, one thing that you can do, here I'll show you real quick. Is I don't have to, if I don't have it on that um, sheet already. So I can come up here and I can wire it across. And if I bring it over here and terminate it, it will automatically... Uh, create that sheet so it gives nice. me a little bit more fluid way for making my top level. 
Very nice. Thanks for that. Uh, yes. 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 Oh, the other thing, again, just following the, uh, the foundation that uh, the gentleman provided us talking about placing design notes. Um, we've got a note frame here. We can, this is more of the, the, um, the type that's the, the um, it's a little harder to get the mouse around here. The type that's more of the stick, sticky note. And then we also have, you know, text frames. And you can come in here and you can change the colors uh, as you need uh, to get the highlights that, that uh, Max was mentioning. The other thing that we, we want to talk about is um, the ERC main, uh, matrix. This is in the project options. Again, understanding your error reporting, um, error reporting during compiling, and then the connection, connection matrix. You basically have all your, your pin types, and then you can determine whether you want mismatches there to be uh, a warning, an error, fatal, et, et cetera. So that's just the environment that you would, would set that up. So what I'm going to do right now is, again, moving along. Um, let me go ahead and get rid of this uh, harness here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use a, um, a blanket. And I don't know if you're using these directives, but we can put a blanket around, say, this group, this uh, UART. Go ahead and get that right here. Put this blanket right here. And then I, I can have this set up in my profiles. Let me just go ahead and redo that again. I'm having a problem here with this mouse. OK. OK, so I've got this, this blanket here. The, uh, the light or the, uh, it's pretty. Let me go ahead and change that to small. And now what I'm going to do is I've grouped these two signals together. And I'm going to go ahead and place a design directive here. And this is, what this does is it then, let me make sure that uh, everything is set up here properly. There we go. And what this is, is this, this is the parameter that then allows us to determine to, to make this a class. Make sure everything is, okay. I got that in there a little too close. So what I'm going to call this is UART1. And this is just really a, a logical name for this parameter set. And then I'm also going to add a net class. And I'm going to also just call that UART1. Okay. So we've added this, this grouping. And then now I can push this up to the, the, the design. And now when I go into the, the, the board design for this, I see that I have a net class, UART1, and it zooms in on the area. So that's how you can, that's how you can, um, group a signal together and add some classes. Now, once you have a class, you can put any type of rule, uh, design rule, you can associate with a group of classes. 
The other nice thing about these net classes that I find very helpful is especially on a larger board, and I've got one here, is that what I'm able to do is when I have all these net classes, and just like Max mentioned, and I found this out the hard way as well, when you do go into your design options and you choose to have your signal harnesses made into uh, net classes, you, you, you have a, a design that's very navigatable, if you will, from like a higher level of abstraction. So if I want to look at my various buses, I can do that very easily here and with really not any inc uh, additional incremental effort. It's a very handy way to, to view the design and of course every one of these classes that I'm choosing can have their own specific designs added to it. So now we talked about, um, we talked about X signals. This particular design has a lot of X signals in it. And you can, you can do X signals. The X signals are not done in the schematic. They can only be assigned right now in the printed circuit board. And, and you can do those by just choosing two components and the wizard will guide you through that. You can also just choose pads where you want your, your, your signal, where it starts and where it ends. And, and you know, what an X signal is used for is to, uh, to be able to abstract out uh, not just nets, but a whole length of a signal that might go through a termination resistor or have some more additional elements in that. And then you can assign the, the, the net names to that. We also have a wizard that allows you to place X signals for common structures like DDR2, DDR3, uh, USB3, and uh, whatnot. Okay, I want to switch back over to this design here. And uh, let's go ahead and just create a differential pair real quick. We do that by placing a directive differential pair. And, and the, key, the key is, is that, again, as Max was mentioning, we have to, you have to have this, in this case I'm doing USB, and you have to have underscore N underscore P. That's what, it, that's what the compiler is looking for uh, to do that. And what I'm going to do is um, go ahead and um, go ahead and add the rule. Yeah, that's. Yeah, I want to put one on there, and then um, I'm looking for my rule. Um, I believe I can push this forward, and it should pick that up. Now when I go in the PCB, and I bring up uh, Differential Pair Editor, Okay, let me go here. Yeah, I, I've got it labeled here. I guess I can let USB. Okay, yeah, that's what, sorry about that. This kind of goes back to what we were talking about, the, the directives in general. Just yeah. having the name on there will get you there. Uh, you have to have the differential pair of the, the class defined before it's actually pull over. Okay, and then at this point we should be able to push it over. Um, 
And we'll give it a shot here. And so we see that pair now. Now if I come in here and choose this, I should be able to route it. And we see that I've got a, a really a sort of a, a, a bad length here, and I could change that rule to give me my spacing and everything. Uh, we're three minutes away from a hard cutoff. Uh, sorry, you sort of got shortchanged on the demo here. Um, we should probably open it up to questions and um, for the for the three of us sorry yeah so Carl was talking about um, solvability of layout. Do you have any good, really good, reliable metrics to estimate the design effort needed based on, for example, number of uh, nets, um, surface of component surface to board surface ratio, and sorts of stuff like that? Well, the, size of, the size of components vary widely in different projects. So um, the greatest tool you have is your experience looking at it, you know, bring the parts up, look at the density of the nets, look at the density of the components, like, the more experienced you get, the better you'll get at estimating that. Um, as a rule of thumb, if you have B-size schematic sheets and they're of normal density, I generally would say the design is going to take about one day per page. So a 15-page schematic is going to be about 15 days of work. It's going to get, that's, as a rule of thumb, it's a super good estimation. Like a 60-page schematic, probably a two-month project um, in general. Like you can compress that by working double shifts or you can compress that by, you know, uh, but, but in general, like for estimation, that's going to be a fairly decent estimate. Now, your question is like, you know, how tough is this going to, that design going to be? If you see that everything's component body to component body and you have almost no room, you know you're in for a hellacious design, right? Like that one's going to be hard. Um, if you see that you have a lot more room than you, are like, yeah, I think we're okay. You know, you'll... You can do more placement and, and have a better idea as farther along as you go. But as far as like an early warning to the engineer or the mechanical design team is like if you bring it up and you don't have enough room, then you know you got a big problem. And if it's in that 90% or above range, then you know you're in real trouble with that design. In the 70 80%, you know you have a hard design, but almost always solvable. Below that, you know, your design efforts are not going to be as hard as it would be if it was in that 70 or 80 percent range, but still be a very competitive board, you know, from a placement, you know, utilization to board real estate. And you'll have a lot better signal integrity probably if you don't have such a great high density also. Like that's going to also impact your ability to space conductors away from each other and reduce crosstalk, things like that. If you have a little bit less you know, if the overall density isn't super high, then that's going to give you a lot more chance to design a good board. Like, don't, try not to, you know, so constrain yourself that you make the design effort really hard in general. Does that, that answer your question? Yeah, that's great. So, so you consider every, everything up to 50% is... Uh, super easy. Yeah, that's yeah. super easy. And up from there, it, I think you said 10%... Yeah, it difficulty gets, yeah, it gets hard as, as, the, as you go up to 60, 70, 80, hmm. yeah, it gets progressively harder at 90 and 100. That's like near impossible. Near and there's like very limited people that would be able to do hmm. that. Like Perfect. That you're really, it. really challenging yourself a lot to do a board of that density. Like you generally shouldn't be trying it. You should ask for a little bit more room. Unless like it's Thanks. a super compact product and you're, you know, really trying to like design something in, you know, totally as small a space as possible and you've already reduced your footprints to the least, you know, size and all that. You know, like there's other tricks you can play too with, with you know, like the footprint geometry. 
Well, I'm, I design almost all my boards with a nominal pattern, uh, IPC pattern, because I want to have a good, reliable solder joint. But if you have a super high dense part, you might choose the least. Unless it's like a real high shock and vibration thing, then you would want to do that. You got to wrap up? Thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay.